Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Jerry Roth. I am the president of the UIA. It is my great pleasure to start us off this morning on this uh, wonderful sort of summary sum up program of a fascinating week of uh, lectures and conferences on issues related to science and the law in a whole variety of contexts. We're going to be having a very interesting hybrid session today. I'm speaking to you from California. I know some of you are there in person in, um, in Italy. We actually have a kind of California, Italy uh, connection here. We have three speakers from California and then several speakers from all over uh, Italy. And we are delighted to have you here. As you know, the UIA has been uh, kicking into its new season of um, uh, 2020. We've got seminars for the next several weeks. We've got a wonderful program coming up of women bar leaders um, where we'll be presenting women bar leaders from around the world at a variety of seminars in different languages. Please check out our website for that. And we also have our virtual Congress coming up on October 28th, three days around the legal world. Um, and we'll be exploring a whole variety of legal issues with social events, ceremony, ceremonies, et cetera, and some special activities that we can only do online that we could not do if we were meeting in person. So I know I speak on behalf of everyone when I say we wish we were all there together in Trieste in person, but this new world gives us some opportunities to be together uh, through our computer. I'm really delighted to kick this session off. And with that, I will turn this, the podium over to Alberto Pazino, uh, who will start us off on the session. I'll click off my camera and I will observe from the back rows. Have a wonderful session, everybody. Thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, just a few welcoming words on behalf of the organizing committee of this series of webinars we had during this week. Uh, the idea we had uh, a few months ago was to seize the opportunity that Azov is given to our city to gather around a table scientists and lawyers to discuss uh, issues of common interest and more particularly to see whether the lawyers are able to give replies to scientists when it gets to issues that science must solve to pro progress further. Uh, today, uh, we will have uh, some speakers from those four webinars chaired by Marco Cattaneo. Before passing him the floor, I would like to thank the people who were involved in organizing these webinars. First of all, of course, I would like to thank the speakers and the moderators. But I shall f first, uh, uh, first thank Azov, uh, Stefano Fantoni, Paola Rodari, Elisabetta Gregori, Cemaglia, Sunde Simoni, helped us a lot to make it possible because without scientists, this series of webinars would have not be possible. Most of all, I would like to thank Paolo Gasparini, because he was the person who, who literally uh, told me who to invite. And uh, if we have today, and we had in the past days, such a brilliant number of, uh, of uh, uh, such a large number of brilliant scientists gather around uh, with us around our virtual tables to discuss this topic. This has been possible due to Professor Paolo Gasparini. So th thanks again to, uh, to the people who were with me, with uh, Paolo Lombardi, Simona Matta, and Olaf Hartenstein, uh, the, the, the people who organized these, uh, these four webinars. And thank you very much, Janice Mulligan, who directly organized one of these four webinars. Uh, Marco Cattaneo, as, as I previously said, uh, will chair this, this event. Marco Cattaneo is a physicist, but since 20 years has been practicing as a journalist. He's the director of the science uh, review Le Scienze, uh, as well as uh, Mente and Cervello in National Geographic. So, uh, Marco, the floor is yours. 
So thank you, thank you very much, and thank you for organizing these very interesting sessions uh, uh, that put together science and law. We know that in the last several decades, I would say uh, probably since World War II, the end of World War II, but more and more in the last several decades, uh, uh, the pace of science has be, been faster and faster, and, uh, and the, the pace of technology has been faster and faster. And law is, is uh, sometimes facing some, some new environments uh, in which we need uh, uh, new legal views, new regulations and new regulatory systems, sometimes at the local level, sometimes at the international level. Uh, so I think that, that the four sessions you, you organized were, were very interesting. And well, we, we have here uh, five of the speakers that will summarize uh, uh, what happened in their, in their uh, uh, sessions uh, about their specific topics. I would like to start from, from John Murray, who joined us from, from uh, California, as we told, who is general manager of Calidris Partners in, in California. And I want to ask him what happened in your session about uh, unmanned vessels, uh, automation and autonomy, and what science is, is bringing uh, to the attention of law right now, and, and how do you think uh, the thing will develop? So, thank you for the opportunity to, um, to participate here. We had a, a, a very uh, insightful um, uh, discussion about uh, autonomous uh, vehicles, in particular autonomous vessels. Um, the, uh, the, the, the entire area of um, uh, automated vehicles and automated transportation systems is, uh, is, is, is very much in the, um, in, in the public eye these days, mostly because of um, uh, automated vehicles, road transport, uh, cars and trucks. Um, the, I think the, the, the unique um, difference um, in in the uh, in the area that we were discussing and uh, related to uh, to seaborne vessels, both um, uh, commercial and military vessels, um, submarines as well as surface vehicles, um, it's quite a bit of difference in the way that they uh, that those systems operate because of the um, uh, international regulations related to um, related to shipping and uh, the extent to which um, uh, the, the, the transport uh, systems are um, substantially more complex than, than your typical uh, automobile or, uh, or, or truck. Um, one of the items I think that, that, that came uh, very much to, our, uh, to our, uh, our attention in the discussion is the interface between um, the humans uh, and the systems. There's, a, there's a, I have a, a maxim that basically says there's no system that doesn't have some human involved in it somewhere. Um, the, the extent in, in, automated, uh, in automated systems, the extent to which the, the um, machine operates uh, uh, autonomously and makes its own decisions um, versus uh, handing over control to, to the humans how that, that transition backwards and forwards between the two is, um, is, is really, really critical. So when it, when, from the point of view of a, the, the legal perspective then, um, I think there's probably uh, a lot of attention has to be paid to the, um, uh, the amount of control that the, 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 the machine cedes to the human and therefore the extent to which the, the human and the organization, um, uh, the controlling organization, may, uh, may be involved in any, uh, in any responsibility or liability for um, uh, when, when things don't go the way they're supposed to go. I think that was, that was the, sort of the, the main theme that we, that we focused on. Yeah, and, and how do you, do you see the developments uh, from, from this point of view? I, I want to ask you, uh, do you think that there will ever be completely autonomous vehicles in this framework? <laughs> I, I personally don't, don't think that that will be the case. Um, we, 
um, it, if if there is, it is so far out that that uh, it's really not not going to be very predictable. We are um, we're talking about um, substantial substantially uh, complex um, artificial intelligence systems modeling real world uh, behavior and real world activity, not just modeling of the humans, but modeling of the, the um, all of the actions surrounding um, surrounding the system, like like weather, for example. Um, when one of the examples that came up in our discussion, in, in, in fact, was was a case, uh, a, a, a lesson um, that needs to be drawn um, from um, from the behavior of autopilot systems in aircraft. Um, one of the uh, things that happens a lot uh, in, in, air, in, in aircraft is that the, the uh, uh, commercial aircraft is put onto autopilot and only when things go wrong do, do the pilots, are the, the human pilots expected to take over. And part of the problem there is that because things don't go wrong very often, your typical pilots don't have a lot of experience of controlling an aircraft under those sort of circumstances. So this, take that story and move it into a, um, a, a, a large complex uh, system like a, uh, like a ship, like a cruise liner, for example. These are huge complex systems and they're, from a legal point of view, each one is going to be individual. There isn't a kind of a cookie cutter approach that a, a, a company or a, 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 an organization is providing multiple identical products. That, that, that isn't the legal way to think of it, I think. So thank you very much. Uh, let, let's see the point of view of a lawyer. So, so in the same session was involved Marco Imperiale, who is lawyer and innovation officer at LCA law firm in Milan, Italy. And well, uh, science, science and more, more than science technology is posing some problems and some challenges. Uh, to law to lawmakers, uh, and well, it's interesting that that John Murray already outlined that that uh, the problem with with uh, unmanned or autonomous vessels uh, is is a problem of international laws, of course, as as these these vessels move uh, around the globe usually. Uh, but what's what's the kind of challenges that this poses to law to lawyers? <laughs> First of all, uh, hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks uh, everyone for the organization and uh, to all the speaker for their insights and the conversations uh, regarding all the pandas, not just mine. Uh, with respect to, uh, to your question, I mean, it would take hours <laughs> probably to go uh, deeper in the subject. So I try to wrap up to synthesize to resume as, uh, as much as possible. Um, Professor Massimiliano Musi and myself were the ones, you know, dealing with the legal aspects of autonomous vessels. And uh, we both agree on the fact that uh, we're seeing uh, challenges that we've never seen before. Uh, the, the fact that the human element uh, can be in discussion is a true novelty and not only regarding uh, maritime law, but for law in general. And of course, uh, the, it's, it's not a matter of you know, black and white because uh, when we are mentioning the concepts of you know, autonomy, automation, technical support, there are different uh, words and different interventions and maybe different regulations that we are facing. And, uh, and there are also many stakeholders, uh, you know, insurance, vessel producers, states, maybe a big corporation, and it's pretty difficult to balance the interests. So I think that we can agree on the fact that we need international framework, and we can agree on the fact that uh, the legal and I would say political element can be a great help or a big obstacle as well for the evolution of science. But it's pretty difficult to decide how to intervene. And even in the legal field, we could have like, you know, different uh, views. Uh, regarding uh, specifically autonomous vessels, where there are adult projects, there are research groups, you know, the Mooning Project, uh, Maritime Manman Navigation for Intelligence Project, the IMO, uh, it's International Maritime Organization, uh, Second Strategic Decision. Regarding AI in general, there are tons of white papers, recommendations, best practice guidelines. 
but uh, we are still in a kind of embryonic phase. And uh, uh, I believe as lawyer that it's uh, necessary to rethink uh, the role of law and lawmakers uh, because uh, the challenges we are seeing, uh, you know, the fact that, uh, for example, uh, an autonomous vessel could have a legal personality on its own, we think uh, need also, um, how can I say, uh, a, a different uh, legal approach. Uh, for example, I'm imagining a more design thinking oriented approach, more interdisciplinary, more hands on, where the lawmakers are experimenting instead of proposing the law, selecting several players, try different legal regulations with them and test them to see also the kind of reaction of, uh, of the society before implementing the rules. Because uh, I think that we can agree on the fact that uh, um, the law is really slow comparing to the evolution of uh, technology and we need to intervene urgently. Uh, if we don't think about you know, uh, autonomous vessels, but if we expand the impact of AI and technology, we can see that there is a true need of uh, new, better laws and also you know, way of uh, sanctioning uh, you know, the ones that don't follow the rules. Uh, let me finish with just a kind of wrap-up uh, uh, evaluations. Uh, the first one is uh, the risk of Cassandra complex. One of the scientists, I think in the second session, highlighted the fact that lawyers can be, you know, are always pessimistic. Sometimes they say, okay, this is out of work, and sometimes they say, uh, it's already too late. So it's, uh, it's pretty difficult to, to say when it's time to intervene, but I think that uh, uh, from the science and law seminars, uh, um, we agreed on the fact that the time to intervene is now, and it's better to intervene you know, as soon as possible. And the second one uh, is that uh, we are also reflecting on the role of science, and not only on the role of law, because uh, uh, how are we lawyers telling what the society should be, and is science telling us uh, what the society is, or are we both telling what the society should be? Because in that case, uh, the communication between science and law, as we are seeing in panels like this, uh, is uh, more crucial than ever. Thank you very much. I have a couple of questions that may be interesting for both of you. Uh, first of all, I think, well, we are speaking about uh, uh, unmanned vessels, and I, and I just thought uh, 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 about the, the, the big accident, the big oil spill that has been in, in, in Mauritius uh, uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, do you know what would happen with an unmanned vessel or, or, or a vessel controlled by, by a, an AI uh, and, and the insurance of the vessel? Uh, if the vessel would have made an accident like that uh, with, uh, with uh, the AI control, from, from the legal point of view, uh, where we are, where we are right now, uh, who would be responsible for this? The AI the company, the insurance of the vessel, the, the wealth? Well, it's a pretty difficult question. And uh, as lawyers, uh, we have to, um, how can I say, uh, to adopt the rule that we have. So we don't, we cannot create after a fact has happened. And uh, we are still uh, a little bit too early. Think that uh, a man vessel can have a legal autonomy on uh, its own. So probably uh, it's, uh, it's a matter of the company or the insurance. But I'm not excluding that uh, in a not too far scenario, and not, um, especially because there are um, interesting pressures, especially from uh, academia, to consider the um, AI means uh, uh, to have a, a legal autonomy on uh, their own. So way more, way beyond the concept of the software companies. But I think it's a little bit too early now and we will need more cases like this uh, uh, to 
intervene from a legal perspective because I, I, I do believe that lawyers can be, uh, the, the legal aspects can be quite related to politics uh, and politics tend to intervene when there's an urgency and uh, it's possible to intervene in a pretty quick and defined way. So the more cases like this we will see in the near future, especially, you know, AI oriented, the, the more the opportunities of seeing uh, specific laws on uh, that matters. Of course, you know, we have guidelines, best practices, but something that can be uh, really adopted in a very strict way. I think we are a little bit uh, uh, early. And final, a small question for both of you. Uh, well, if, if uh, we, we come out from, from, uh, from the specific topic of, of unmanned vessels, uh, we know it's, it's very early, but there's a, a number of AI companies and, and IT companies that are pushing for unmanned cars or, or automated cars. Uh, do you think, well, we are used to have uh, uh automation on, on on planes but do you think that people are ready to to accept from a psychological point of view somehow uh that that uh, uh someone else a computer and an artificial intelligence drives your own car and on the other side do you th it's true as as john murray said before that uh, unmanned vessels are are much more complex uh, a much much more complex uh, uh, system than 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 the automation on planes but on the other side i think that uh, the, the frequency of car accidents in our roads and the frequency of, of car use in our roads poses a very big problem of com of complexity for automated cars uh, do you foresee a, a future for these issues or not? And, and how should science and law face it before we have automated cars in our roads? Well, so we, we already have automated cars on the roads. Um, and there have been, as, as you pointed out, there have been, have been accidents. I think one thing that is... Um, uh, one thing that it, the... the um, the, the automated car companies, I, I don't feel that they pay enough attention to the, to, to the real, real world environment where, um, uh, how, about how an automated system in, interacts with the, with the non-automated cars surrounding it. Um, it's, everything is fine if all of the vehicles are, are automated and they're, they're coordinating communication with each other and that, that that's a concept that that has been tested in uh, in times past and uh, platooning for example a whole set of cars all uh, linked to virtually linked together going down the freeway just like a train um, that sort of uh, uh, those sort of concepts are are being explored one one thing I'm, I, I find surprising is is that um, they, uh, a, a lot of the testing has been done in, in environments which are relatively benign for cars. Um, they, there was an accident some time ago in Phoenix, Phoenix, Arizona. Um, the, Phoenix is not a good place to be testing cars. The, the, it, it's bright, it's sunny, the roads are all straight, it's flat. This is not the environment. I, I, I want automated cars to be tested in Cairo or in Mexico City or even in Rome or, Karachi. or even Rome <laughs> yes okay the, the, that those are the environments where where this gets complicated one other little point I just want to latch on to something that that uh, that you that you mentioned um you mentioned people driving at uh, driving their having their own car driving down the road automatically uh, maybe that's not the business model at all maybe the 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 car, you don't own the car. The car comes and picks you up and it takes you wherever, just Uber and Lyft are investing heavily in this area. They're, they're, the drivers in the Uber and Lyft model are, are they're temporary. They, they'll go away and the cars will be automated. So perhaps it's not our own cars that will be automated so much and no more than we own our own train or our own bus. Just to add a couple of considerations, I think that there are, you know, lots of different perspectives, you know, from a rational perspective, I think that uh, 
uh, we will see something changing uh, when we will be able to adopt a statistic mindset. So when uh, we are capable to see that uh, the number of deaths, the number of accidents uh, is uh, uh, lower than the one that we have uh, with human drivers, uh, then maybe we can adopt. But uh, how are we able to adopt a statistic mindset when we are speaking about injuries or deaths? Uh, from a technological perspective, I think that uh, we will see big changes because uh, sometimes we think, uh, oh, it's just a matter of technology, but uh, in most of the cases, it's a matter of connectivity. So the technology is already there, but with 5Gs, we will see a boost, and especially in terms of latency. Uh, so I am forecasting uh, uh, um, an increment both in production, uh, in uh, development, in testing, uh, uh, in advertising uh, regarding you know, self-driving vehicles. From uh, a marketing perspective, which is uh, very interesting because we are speaking about people, uh, you know, there is a huge pressure because uh, self-driving cars can uh, help us uh, using all the time uh, that we you know, spend commuting uh, doing something else. So we can spend that time working, we could spend the time you know, watching our smartphone, could spend the time you know, watching TV, listening to music, and, uh, uh, and I think that this is a huge added value because uh, you know, the, the only thing that <laughs> there's a scarcity in this society is time. So having the possibility of uh, earning, uh, gaining one hour, half an hour per day, it's a huge incentive. So there are lots of wonderful uh, perspectives to put on. Of course, there are also, you know, the um, legal and, and political ones. But uh, I am I'm the first one to be very interested to see if uh, the states uh, will be able to adopt an, an all, um, kind of a coherent uh, approach or if they will decide to proceed uh, on their own. And uh, as European, I think that uh, it's, it's time for the European Union to intervene seriously on the matter as, uh, as an institution without letting yeah. states uh, in intervene on their own because uh, the political power that uh, you, know, uh, you have as a, <laughs> as a community of states is uh, way bigger. And so even uh, um, the results that you can obtain can be bigger as well. So this is a typical issue, issue that requires common rules. Yep. So thank you. Thank you very much to both John Murray and Marco Imperiale for their presentations. And let's move uh, to, to another topic. Well, another big topic, I would say, because, because the most important, well, probably some of the most important challenges uh, come, come from, uh, from the world of, of science and biomedical science and life sciences. Uh, so the second session was dedicated to liberty, identity, laws in a world of genes and genomes. And well, I ask uh, Paolo Gasparini, who has been the moderator of, of the session, uh, to summarize what happened in your, in your discussion. Paolo, welcome. Thank you, Marco. Uh, first of all, let me thank the, um, Alberto for the very nice words uh, of his uh, introduction. I simply spent some time discussing with him. Uh, he's a good friend of mine to helping him in identifying some um, possible candidates, top quality candidates for this um, meeting. Um, the webinar was extremely uh, interesting. Uh, as you mentioned, is extremely um, is a field in which uh, law and science need to go together to solve a series of issues. And the main issues we discussed were, are, for example, the presence of blurred frontiers between clinical care and research. So, which is the boundary? In, uh, in terms also of rights, uh, individual rights of, uh, of, of whole genome sequencing data or big data related to the genome, uh, and the uh, rights of the society. In most of cases, uh, the genome sequencing data are obtained through uh, national healthcare systems or public bodies, uh, so using uh, strong investments and huge efforts from uh, from, from national healthcare system, from public money, 
and, and the benefits to the society could be extremely relevant. So which is the boundary in which is ends my right as individual, as patient, and start the right of the, of, of, of the, of the society to use also for the benefit of the society uh, the same amount of data. And then another important issue uh, discussed was the consent. Uh, there is, a, of course, there is a need of consent, but the consent should adapt to a rapidly evolving field. And this is not easy. It's, uh, in many cases, a very difficult task. Um, we also discussed about the possibility of uh, dynamic consent, something which is, can, which is currently used uh, mainly in research, not that much in diagnostic. And, and also about the communication of results. Um, how to communicate results uh, when interpretation is uncertain? How should patients, for example, be informed of the so-called incidental findings uh, that unequivocally can predict serious diseases that can be prevented or uh, ameliorated? And even more, thinking to the future, if I'm going, if I decide to undergo to whole genome sequencing, so I am, I am aware that someone is going to read everything. Still, we, can we talk about incidental findings or not? Because it's incidental means something unexpected. But if I decide to, see, to read everything, uh, def, I mean, I'm, I'm, go, I'm in some way I'm aware that there could be something that, uh, of course, I, I didn't know even before. And then another important issue is the issue of data sharing for um, to get the, ma the maximum amount of, uh, of, of value of genomic uh, data you need to share. To, and, and, and to share not only uh, with your friends or uh, people uh, in, in, in the lab close to you, but you need to share at the international level. And to share at the international level, you need to solve a series of issues in terms of privacy, sharing of data, anonymizations, completely different rules across different countries, even, in, in, even within Europe. Um, but that, that is essential, is an essential step. Uh, and then there was uh, another important issue is IP, IP protection of, uh, of genomic information, but also of the new products arising from uh, uh, genetic engineer uh, and um, and one of the um, the, the following uh, issue was uh, GMOs as you already mentioned uh, before Marco in, in, when we were uh, uh, discussing bef before starting this session and uh, most of the new products uh, in, in terms of innovative therapy the so-called advanced therapeutic medicinal products belong to the group of gene therapy, despite they are used for uh, treat inherited diseases or to treat cancer. But there is, as you mentioned, there is a completely new technology, which is, the name is genome editing, based on CRISPR-Cas9 uh, technology and something, uh, new, uh, let's say, improvements of the, of the same technology. And all these products right now in Europe are considered genetically modified organisms, but uh, under the umbrella, uh, but still, for example, there are different rules and, and, and uh, uh, on the, on, on, on across Europe. The discussion right now is focused on what, what we consider as a GMOs. Um, but for example, uh, there are no common rules and no harmonization at all regarding viral shedding, but with the rare diseases, patients, and in the future with such expensive technologies, patients will move from one country to the other. And the, the so-called environment risk assessment is completely different in one country from the other. And these make a lot of troubles for even for companies to produce their dossier. And, and also these genome editing could have a strong impact on, uh, uh, on intellectual property. We discussed if the current IP framework can cover uh, products that are uh, produced with genome editing, and I'm not sure that the IP will cover 100% uh, because with genome editing you are going to target single mutation, uh, in diff even within the same gene. So you, at the end you will have different products, and and it will not that easy to um, cover uh, with under the same uh, IP protection 
IP procedure, uh, everything. Um, let me say that was an extremely uh, uh, useful and fruitful discussion and session. But um, maybe in some way I was, as a chair, and, and, on, and the two uh, very uh, top quality uh, speakers, we were in some way uh, taking advantage by the fact that the two fields start talking each other uh, since many, many years uh, ago, maybe decades. Uh, in some way, every day, we are forced to talk with, uh, uh, with, with, with lawyers um, to define uh, rules and, and, and guidelines. Um, so in some way, we are aware of each other, the, of the need of each other. And, and, uh, and just for example, I am a um, member of the Committee for Advanced Therapy of the European, um, of the EMA, European Medicine Agency, and sitting with us, the representative of the European Commission is a lawyer. And let me say that in my opinion, um, in, 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 in our field, what still is an issue is to find a common language. We already uh, are aware that we need each other. The issue is to find a common language. And the, most of the time we spend um, on, and in the Committee for Advanced Therapy is to, f is to write with the proper words, adjectives, which mainly belong to the, the world of lawyers than of us, uh, how the, the dossier of uh, the new products, uh, how to write the, the correct guidelines, because an adjective um, uh, could be interpreted in completely different ways, and especially if it's something used by a uh, scientist more than a lawyer. Um, and, and apart from this, I think that most of the people attending the, the webinar uh, enjoyed the, 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 the topics discussed, and that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Paolo. I, I would, let, would have a lot of questions for you, but, but I will start first uh, uh, from one which is quite easy. Uh, we have seen in the last couple of months, I would say maybe more, more than a couple of months, three months or four months, uh, that uh, Italy has approved uh, um, an application for, for our smartphones uh, that uh, each uh, citizen could or should download, which is the app Immuni, uh, for contact tracing during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, there has been a lot, a lot of discussion about it. And finally, only 10% of Italian citizens has pro have probably uh, downloaded this app. So uh, even if even if this doesn't doesn't uh, reveal uh, any any information about the identity of of, uh, of positive or infected people or personal data, uh, at the same time there's a, an incredible amount of people uh, leaving their personal data for free to private companies that sell this data and do whatever they want with this data. So how do you think that uh, uh, the public interest uh, uh, has failed in convincing people that, that this kind of applications are, are uh, for the global and the general interest, uh, while, uh, while a, a, a private company, a, a, let's say a social network or something like that, is as such an easy task in confounding people and, and grabbing their, their own data. Uh, thank you, Marco. It is not very easy to answer, but it's something we also well, discuss. No, I don't. I'm not known for, for making easy questions usually. But yeah, yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, let's say, uh, first of all, there could be uh, differences in terms of, um, of age. Uh, for example, even in, in, uh, in, in talking about genome sequencing uh, or genomic information, any kind of genomic information, including diet to consumer tests, uh, and maybe you, are, you know very well, for example, 23andMe, um, um, there is a very, I mean, the, 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 the young generation are much more open-minded. They, they, they share almost everything, uh, including genomic sequencing uh, data. And so, uh, part, uh, at least part could be, the answer could be the difference 
in, in, in the perception of what is uh, the relevance of sharing of the perception of privacy between different generations. Um, in, in my opinion, even more, I, I'm, I was also fighting against COVID uh, as a department, and then in my opinion there was also a lot of uh, chaos in presenting the, 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 the app. It was not very clear at the very beginning which kind of tracing they were offering, and, and then there were people was really afraid of being uh, forced to quarantine if identified as a, as a possible contact of a positive person. But you are right. I, I, I think the perception of sharing the data is, is completely different. And, uh, and uh, for example, with 23andMe, uh, you are not only sharing uh, the data, but you, you can also identify your relatives across the world. And this is something that people accept a lot. And they are very uh, curious. And I have several uh, friends uh, who gave as a present uh, to their adopted child, for example, uh, the, the, the possibility to do um, the test of 23andMe, and then through the test, identify uh, first cousin, second cousin, any kind of relatives across the world. It's completely different uh, perception. Okay, you are talking to someone who, who was involved uh, in, in two genome sequencing, who's me, yeah? Uh, uh, to genome sequencing, but, but for uh, genetics population purposes, I'm, I've made the genographic project at National Geographic, and I, and I asked to evaluate uh, the, same, the same things from Family 3 DNA, uh, which is a private company on the other side. But I, I participated and I was involved in this project, but I didn't ask uh, to, to check my genome for risk factors, and I wouldn't share these risk factors. Uh, but on the other side, I ask myself, if I don't, uh, is this a problem even for research? So not having data enough uh, uh, from a population, uh, from, from single users, uh, uh, is, can be a problem. Well, I mean, I mean if everybody makes uh, uh, genome sequencing for, for personal reasons, but uh, uh, wants, don't, doesn't want to share his data with, with the science, uh, uh, do you think it could, it could slow the pace of science in this field? Definitely, yes. Uh, what we need uh, is to have as much information as we can through database, and especially if these informations information are, um, um, goes together with a lot of clinical phenotypes. What we really need, for example, is to uh, know precisely the role uh, and the function of, of a series of variants, um, of, of, ge of genomic variants, of DNA variants, um, because otherwise, uh, the, in, in many, many cases, uh, we have to, to uh, answer to patients and their relatives uh, that we, we found something of completely uncertain function. And this is not, of course, uh, uh, the, 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 the thing we would like to do. And, and let me say that year after year, uh, decreasing amount of data uh, in the database are helping us in re revising uh, patients and families and, um, and offering them, at the end, a proper diagnosis. And this is something we are doing every day, every day, every month, reanalyze uh, all the unsolved cases. Thank you very much, Paolo. Let's let's keep being in the in the field of, of medicine, but but let's go to the third session. And thanks, Janice Mulligan, for being here. Thanks to all our Californian guests because I, I realize that it's quite early in California right now. And well, uh, Janice, you spoke about telemedicine at the tipping point. Well, the pandemic, once more, the pandemic uh, accelerated the spread of telemedicine, but but there are some legal changes needed and, and well uh, how was your session uh, what did you discuss uh, and then and then i'll make you some some questions thank you you're welcome thank you good morning you can see the sun rising uh, in the window behind me so we're at the opposite end of the world 
Uh, first of all, thank you to the organizing committee, Alberto, thank you very much. And also special thanks to Simona Mata, who was instrumental in getting our group together. We had a wonderful uh, panel because it was very diverse. For example, we had two scientists, one, uh, Dr. Simon Montero, who's the former director of the Portuguese National Center of Telehealth. We had Dr. Lawrence Friedman from University of California, San Diego, where he started the telemedicine department. On the legal side, two lawyers, one, Eliana de Silve Moraes, who's a Brazilian lawyer who also practices in France, uh, advising corporations. And I am uh, the president of the UIA Health Law Section Commission, and I am a patient advocate. So across the board, we had a mix. And it made for, uh, somebody described it as an electric uh, presentation because of the di divergent views. So first, let's start out. What is telemedicine? It is so simple. It is as easy as a doctor in one place, a patient in another, using any means of communication, like telephone. Pretty old school, huh, for this group. But of course, with the development of AI, with big health data, it has become uh, amazing potential to put specialists at the top of the field in one place, together with people living in rural communities who may not have access to healthcare and to allow them to communicate. There are probably very few positive things that have come out of this pandemic so far, but one of them is telehealth, telemedicine, because with one fell swoop in March, when there was lockdown and everyone was told to stay at home, we went from societies such as in Portugal and California, where there had been much resistance to telehealth from insurance companies, from governments, from regulators, when one week, all of that was solved because of necessity. Uh, Dr. Friedman explained to us how UCSD went from almost zero patients being seen by telehealth, that it had been just a research tool, to 80% of all patients being seen. Yeah, pretty good, huh? The similar experience in Portugal, a population of 10 million, there have been 8 million telehealth sessions since March. Wow! How was this made possible? Because of necessity, the government cut through everything, put in emergency uh, provisions, insurance companies were made to pay, the government in Portugal gave 5% extra payment if patients were seen by telehealth. So there was an incentive there. Does this mean, okay, no more problems? Why am I even here? Let's close up shop, go home. Uh, no, because the problem is once this emergency is over, these waivers in the law will revert and the problems we had before come back. So the problems are one, uh, Regulation, while doctors would all like to be able to see patients in other places, increase their, their population, they're very guarded in not wanting doctors to come from other places to see the patients in their own locale. So, you know, in the United States, we have 50 little fiefdoms, if you will, of almost sovereign states that regulate medicine. So the problem is they don't license the doctors. You have a doctor from California giving advice to a patient in Texas. Texas considers that a felony. That is punishable as a criminal offense. Jail up to one year for each time an out-of-state doctor provides care to a Texas patient through telemedicine. Ah, I'd say we got a long way to go before the problem is solved. So through our discussion, we talked about what can be done. And actually, one of the solutions um, was articulated better in a different session. While in telemedicine, we talked about the need to coordinate and, and resolve the issues with legal concepts such as jurisdiction. Where is it going to be? Is the court going to be where the patient is located or where the doctor is located? The solution came when I was listening to the climate change seminar. I know we'll hear from Florence next. And I heard uh, the, uh, the moderator, Andrew Grosso, the attorney say, you know, the problem is more political. And while law can be a bridge, 
fish. We really need to bring uh, the politicians to the table. We need to change the mindset of the individuals. Now, while we didn't articulate it in exactly those words in our session, Dr. Friedman uh, from UCSD more or less was consistent with this solution when he said, when you look at the problem of telemedicine in the United States and you see that there are some political forces that say maybe the best treatment for COVID is to drink bleach. Ah! <laughs> and you see the scientists saying, no, don't drink the bleach. <laughs> if we have to drink something, better we go when we drink wine and forget about the trouble. Uh, and of course, you're in Trieste. We wish we were with you. Between California and, and Italian wine, I think this is a better solution than bleach. But it shows us that the mindset has to change. That yes, the law can be a bridge, but we need society to have the mindset to solve the problem. And once society allows us to solve the problem, well, looking at telemedicine as an example, how quickly we went from zero participation to 80% of all doctor visits being seen remotely by telemedicine. So that was our discussion. So thank you very much. And, uh, uh, well, just a first question. You mentioned that, that after the, the COVID emergency, the, this situation will probably revert. Do you think it will completely revert or, or, or uh, we will keep at least part of this experience? You see me crossing fingers, yes? Uh, opportunity <laughs> somehow. Yeah, Dr. Freeman uh, estimates that if the law will allow it, that uh, the prediction is about, we'll go from 80% of the patients being seen remotely to perhaps 30%. Why the difference if there's no more pandemic? Because there are limits to what can be done. I mean, at its best, we have robotic surgery, yeah? Uh, they're doing surgery at a distance, but the reality is you can't palpate, you know, for a tumor mass in somebody's neck remotely. It's hard to see, you know, my eyes would, <laughs> I'll bear you not sticking out my tongue, but you get the idea that there are some things done better in person. So yes, telemedicine will have a role in the future if the law and society will allow it to be integrated. Okay, second question. Uh, as, as, I see, as far as I see, uh, there are some big differences between, well, let's say Europe and Italy and the US, of course, uh, for, for a lot of reasons, which are we have a, a mostly public health system, while, while the US is mostly private. Uh, we don't have usually insurances involved in, 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 uh, in the public system. Uh, and, and I don't know if there's a difference also from, from, the, from the audience point of view, so the people point of view. Uh, I don't know if, if uh, a British or Italian or German person uh, would be more or less uh, kind to telemedicine than, than an American. Uh, but do you think that uh, this kind of differences, well, the, 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 the general differences, uh, require different approaches in the different countries from the legal point of view and which are uh, on one and the other side the most important legal issues? Excellent question and thank you. Yes, and um, the EU can provide guidance to the United States in this regard. In the EU jurisdiction, which is which court laws apply, um, say that for telemedicine, jurisdiction is where the physician is. Well, the reason that's important is because wherever the physician is physically located, one can presume they're licensed to practice medicine, yeah? <laughs> so that's easy. But the implications are that they have malpractice insurance for it. If there are lawsuits, the court where the doctor is located controls. The United States is the exact opposite right now. It is where the patient is located that jurisdiction is found, which is why you have the problem with if Texas patient is being treated by California doctor, well, Texas looks at the California doctor and says, you're not licensed in Texas. This is illegal. This is a crime. It's the same as though you, you know, the veterinarian was trying to do the surgery on the patient because they're not licensed. So if the United States were to adopt the EU model 
and allow jurisdiction to exist where the doctor is located rather than the patient, it would facilitate the implementation of telemedicine, apart from all the insurance issues. But it is a political issue that prevents it from happening because each state decides for itself. And while some states have a pact that allows doctors from a different state to practice medicine across the lines, it's only 12 states. So in the majority of states, the doctors would be committing a crime to continue to treat patients after this emergency waiver is over if they want to keep seeing patients in other states. So the EU is ahead of the United States on this issue. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, on the other side, uh, uh, I see that that this kind of, of uh, differences uh, wouldn't wouldn't allow at all a, 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 an international regulation on, on this topic. One could hope it would. I have a friend who uh, does medical malpractice defense in New York, and he tells me that some of the finest doctors in New York are doing robotic surgery for European patients but they can't do it for a California patient. So it, it depends upon the laws of each country, but you know, nothing in New York law prevents a New York doctor from doing telemedicine surgery if the laws where the patient is uh, located allow it. The, the only reason telemedicine exists in California before the COVID is we have a huge state. And so the doctors at University of California, San Diego, could provide medical care to somebody living in Death Valley, also in California. But most states in the US are not as large as California and they're confined by their small borders. Thank you very much, Janice, for, for your passion also, because, because <laughs> your, your presentation was very interesting and, and well, let's say, uh, let's wish that telemedicine has, has a future uh, after the pandemic. Uh, but as, as you mentioned, we had a, a fourth session, uh, which is uh, concerning one of the, uh, well, I would say the most important problem mankind has uh, and will have in the next in the next several decades and probably centuries uh, so session number four was uh, uh, concerning environmental protection and climate change how can law respond to scientific challenges and and i think there's a lot a lot really a lot of ambitious we, we we should uh, uh, face on this subject. And I call uh, Florence Coleoni, uh, who is a senior scientist of the National Institute of Oceanography and Applied Geophysics in Trieste, Italy. So she's at home right now. Uh, and Florence, just, just to summarize in 10 minutes what happened in your session. Thank you. Thanks, Marco. And first, I would like to recognize uh, Alberto for uh, organizing this very interesting uh, cycle of the seminar, actually, because it's, uh, it's really inspiring, uh, because it's uh, like building the future indirect. <laughs> so um, what happened in our session about climate change and biodiversity and, and conservation, I think uh, those two problems, they are tightly linked with all the other webinars somehow, <laughs> because um, so we, we know that climate is changing. We know that it will still uh, change. And um, the damage it will cause us will not stop. Uh, they will uh, perhaps become more frequent, uh, increased, and they will definitely, definitely um, impact different kind of populations, coastal population, uh, inland populations, mountain populations, polar people, uh, uh, tropical people. So it's really a, a problem that is uh, worldwide. And um, ecosystem is also a, a matter of um, uh, how how we, we take care of our resources, how we take care of our planet, which is the home of everybody uh, on this earth. And um, the resources that we use to live are taken di directly from nature. So um, climate change and biodiversity and uh, natural resources are intimately linked together. So what was said in the session is that of course, because uh, in terms of uh, biodiversity, uh, we, we know we have been deteriorating all the environments 
from polar to tropics uh, to mid latitudes to forests to coastal to mountains. So um, our ecosystems are really suffering from climate changes and from human pollutions. I mean, human pollution also causes climate changes, but um, there are different forms of pollution and some of them do not really impact on climate changes and some of them directly impact on it. So um, the, what was told about the, the diversity is that um, it's not too late to really save many of the ecosystems that we are definitely threatening right now and that we think have, are being will be threatened by uh, projected climate changes. Um, to do that, we need to foster the development of technology, the development of um, approaches of uh, sustainability of resources uh, in which law can definitely uh, help the different actors of green and blue economy to, to really develop this kind of uh, more uh, sustainable philosophy uh, to our natural resources. On another hand, uh, there is the climate change that causes uh, sea level rise and also temperature rise and so causes uh, uh, strong damages um, uh, to uh, our uh, living spaces in, in general. And um, the, the main impact that we, we discussed was about the climate migration that are caused by climate change. Uh, so this is a direct social economical impact. And um, uh, uh, there is, what we said is that th there is a huge gap in terms of law to address this kind of problem because relocate people means find new spaces. So there are countries that can afford that because their territory is really large, so they have the space to relocate people, but relocating people also means uh, support them in changing their economical uh, incomes, so the, the activities. The fact that climate change will also impact on the territories so causing drought or fires or uh, floodings or permanent area that will definitely be damaged means that activities will also have to change uh, in the future. So um, what we see is that there is no structure no law structure to really address this from uh, an international perspective and I think the first um, the first uh, testi testimony of that is the, the failure of the COP conferences that try to bring the people together to bridge the differences between the countries and mitigate carbon emissions, which has been a huge failure because many countries now uh, withdrawn from the, the, the discussions and there is no really uh, will to, for example, reach what has been agreed on the Paris Agreement, like uh, mitigate emission to stay beyond uh, uh, increase of temperature of two degrees Celsius. Um, so because there is no international consensus about that, uh, the problem must be addressed at national levels and local levels. And there is a huge amount of work to be done in collaboration with lawyers because um, facing different changes of the territory means developing engineering uh, techniques, uh, developing new effectively uh, um, uh, technology for, for example, uh, telemedicines, because uh, perhaps some populations we got very, uh, will be very isolated. So all those kind of very helpful technology will become the heart of the, of the future. And at the same time, we need to foster the development of sustainable technology. It's not that we need to develop technology, but they have also to be uh, in agreement with the resources we have. Um, so uh, from this point of view, there is everything to be done. Uh, and uh, so far, uh, I'm not sure there is a lot of uh, structure to support the people that, for example, uh, are damaged by climate change, like um, hurricanes or floodings or fires. I mean, uh, insurance companies are really reluctant in, uh, in supporting the people if they are not, if, of course, uh, subscribed to a policy, a policy. But in many countries, there is even no policy related to climate changes or cl natural disasters. And in the future, this will become mandatory in some territories that are uh, experiencing very frequent and regular uh, natural disasters. Um, and then it, it will have to be addressed somehow to help them from the legal perspective to really uh, yeah, redevelop their future, uh, remake the bounds with the society if they, lost, if they lose everything. So, I would say that um, what we, we try once to make a huge European project to address the next uh, sea level projections and we contacted insurance company here and the response was they were not interesting because for them it's not an immediate problem. 
But so the, the point with climate change is climate change will not disappear. Sea level will still rise, temperature will still rise, and so our environment will change and it's already changing. So we need to bring it forward. It's not that we have to wait for the emergency, which uh, this is what we all tend to do. We, we just wait to be uh, just in front of the wall to just react to emergencies. But in the term with, with climate change, I think we, we need to really think that at some point we will have no resources somehow. So the, the on the point of when the law should step in this process, it's just right now, because it's already happening in many regions of the world. So this is what was mainly said during this session. Thanks. Thank you, Florence, and thank you for mentioning that, that uh, insurance companies are not interested in, in, in this, this subject, because I'm quite surprised. I mean, uh, they should be the first to be interested in. I, I can imagine that, that uh, uh, extreme meteorological events like, like hurricanes, like Katrina or Sandy in the United States have made a, an enormous amount of damage uh, and, and probably an enormous amount of refund by, by insurances. So, so they should be the first interested in. Uh, but well, on, 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 from some point of view, it's surprising. From some other, no, uh, because I see that that it's so hard uh, to reach uh, uh, an international agreement on on climate change and and greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, that that uh, the, the best thing that has been done right uh, till now is is the the Paris Agreement. Uh, that doesn't involve uh, serious serious. Uh, serious goals from from the countries there's no there's no way to to get out of it now uh, about one year ago the international monetary fund itself said that probably a carbon tax different in the different countries uh, uh, would be the only way prior to reduce emissions uh, how do you think that lawmakers should act this way because i know that people are, are bored of paying taxes and and this is right so this should not be an additional tax but but uh, a tax that is different from the others so you pay less or of, of uh, normal taxes and you pay more for how much you you how many emissions you make uh, do you think this is something that could that could uh, work? So, personally, I'm not convinced that the carbon tax is the answer um, because uh, many things we are thinking about right now, so like carbon tax or any other adaptation actions, are just uh, not addressing the problem. Uh, because the problem of emission is worldwide and emission are circulating because of atmospheric circulation. So if a country emits some emissions, uh, it will not stay uh, above the country, it just travels around. So the, the problem is the carbon tax is not, I think it's not the right answer. The, the good answer would be investing in new alternative technology that can uh, substitute uh, technology that use carbon based fuels or uh, energy. I think that's, that's the obvious answer. But this is where the state are not willing to really invest because of the uh, oil companies uh, lobby and, uh, and everything. So everything is blocked from this point, from this perspective. Otherwise, uh, I would say if we want to develop a new technology, many things already exist. It's just putting, injecting a bit more funding to develop them more uh, widely and so that the prices can be afforded by many uh, families that are not, uh, that are, do not have a lot of uh, high incomes, for example. And so they can substitute their car, that they can isolate the houses. And so we can decrease the emission quite efficiently. And I'm very convinced we can do that if we, if we really invest in research. So investing in research, I think it's the, the answer for future. Carbon tax is not a good solution, I think. And um, this is where the law can definitely help. Uh, I think uh, supporting this kind of uh, innovation in science, uh, developing the ethical uh, that is linked to this kind of new technology and alternative resources. Thank you. And there's there's a last question I want to ask you, uh, which is uh, when 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 we come to to climate change, uh, I say don't ask me. You have to ask the farmers because they are those who already know what climate change is. 
uh, if you go, well, well, many farmers are affected from climate change and I'm not speaking of family farmers or only of family farmers in, in, in uh, remote places of the world, but big farms uh, uh, or big winemakers in California and in Italy uh, are, are suffering from climate change already. So they will have a huge damage uh, from, uh, from uh, greenhouse gas emissions that they don't make. And, and there are already some climate litigations around the world, but who will be charged for the damage uh, that these people will get? Uh, states, uh, uh, private, uh, I don't know, oil companies, who will be charged for that? For that? Because that's that's not the only the only problem of, of let's say moving people uh, from from coastal areas uh, for for the increase of uh, for the increase of sea rise, but there's also this big and huge economy damage that will be that, that we will probably face. Did you discuss this this topic this issue? So we, we didn't, but uh, somehow there are a lot of examples, I think, worldwide uh, about uh, companies and uh, farmers or uh, uh, others uh, suing the, the states uh, yeah. at, that, uh, at that level uh, just to, for not respecting uh, the, the, the threshold they, they, and the, the, the level of emission they wanted to meet uh, at, some, at a certain time. So, for the moment, that's why we say there is a huge gap in terms of law for the addressing these kind of issues because there is nothing to help those people uh, effectively get paid back for the, the damage caused by those natural disasters or greenhouse gases emissions. So uh, for the moment, people are suing the states. Uh, in some cases, it has been successful, and, but it's very seldom. And I think uh, it will be more and more frequent because, of course, uh, all, all the people that are using soils uh, to grow up resources uh, or develop wines or uh, whatever resources, actually, they are effectively suffering and they will suffer in the future, that's for sure. I mean, so, um, yeah, that's why we say there is a gap. It needs to be uh, addressed uh, just to, to help those people. Thank you very much, Florence, because you, 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 you allow me to close uh, uh, this discussion, at least before, before a Q&A from, from the hall, because uh, you allow me to, to close it, because I think that, that we, we went back to lawmakers and laws. Uh, without uh, uh, the action of lawmakers, uh, uh, the states will be sued uh, for climate change, and it's possible that the state would be held responsible uh, for, for not making fair laws and fair regulations in other fields concerning science in some way. Uh, I'm asking if there are some questions from the whole, because I see some people, but I don't see, can you raise a hand? Okay, I'm sorry, okay. but I can't hear unless you, you speak in the microphone. Okay, I have a question for Florian. If uh, we make a carbon, a carbon tax, the prevent of carbon tax, can we use it to restore farmers and people from damage they suffer from climate change? Uh, well, of course, uh, you need to find the, modest, the money somewhere to help those people. But if you take the tar if you make the population paying the carbon tax, it's like also asking themselves to pay themselves for their the damage. So, yeah, of course, partly it can compensate. But then it becomes a citizen effort. And will it be, will it be useful to um, urge the state to really uh, mitigate carbon emissions? I mean, that's what's the, the, what was behind the, my, my answer. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you need some incomes to, to help them, uh, financially speaking, but uh, it cannot be like that forever, right? Uh, Marco, my, I myself have a question, uh, if I may. Uh, I understand that there is a dialogue between scientists and lawyers, or scientists and, and uh, yeah, I would say between scientists and lawyers. This is a very satisfactory result of this seminar. What I do understand is that there is a problem with the lawmakers. 
Uh, and this is where in, because uh, I, I deal with maritime law, the Convention on Safety of Life at Sea was, uh, was issued in 1914, two years after the sinking of the Titanic. So if we transfer this, for example, on unmanned vessels, we see that, generally speaking, the attitude is to wait and see. So wait, wait, let's wait to see the unmanned vessel going around, and then let's regulate that. So my question would be to each one of the panelists, if you were able to address the lawmaker, what would be the solution you would ask them in your field? Uh, so I would start with artificial intelligence and robotics, and then on among the other speakers. If you do agree with that question, Marco Catanio, that would be interesting to, to listen, the replies. Oh, oh, oh yes, I do. I do agree, and, and it's very interesting because because uh, I, I see a, a number of issues that that should be uh, that, that should be po posed to 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 the lawmakers, and and I see that the problem is lawmakers uh, who are probably decades far from 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 uh, the progress of science and technology right now. Uh, let, let's ask our panelists. Uh, what do they think, uh, and what is what is urgent right now from lawmakers in their in their uh, subjects? Well, I can I can uh, address that. Um, I think that uh, one of the one of the key issues um, confronting uh, the, the the industry or the the the, uh, the the field, if you will, is. Um, a lack of um, a lack of technical understanding from the, from the point of view of a lot of um, a lot of lawmakers that you don't tend to get uh, that many um, uh, politicians drawn from the technical fields. Um, on the other hand, they are in a position to 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 control and mandate and encourage uh, education education changes. And I think that, that that's a, an area that, that is really important from the point of view of the technical fields, um, a much greater appreciation among engineers of the, um, the, the ethical side of, um, of, 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 of this, this matter and a, a better understanding of the way the, the, um, the legal system works. We have, uh, there's ethical training is required for doctors, for, for, for lawyers in, in business schools not nearly as much in engineering and sciences. Thank you, it's quite interesting. Anybody else would like to, to give an answer about this? Janice. Thank you. Idealistic, but I think the best solution from my perspective would be remove borders. <laughs> Globalize. The science crosses borders, but the laws are very regional. Okay, I guess it's my turn. Uh, there's a wonderful quote from Oscar Wilde. It says that something worse than injustice and it's the justice without a sword. So I think that one of the ways uh, we can have to intervene seriously about, uh, I think all the topics uh, we have mentioned today and all of them are significantly uh, urgent for different reasons is uh, uh, work on the sanctions and uh, be sure that uh, uh, there's a kind of respect uh, for uh, them because once we see both as citizens and professionals a blurred scenario in the regulatory landscape, uh, there's more space uh, uh, to intervene. Of course, I have my ideas about legal technical interventions on the topics, but I think that uh, uh, the sanction element, uh, whether you're speaking about climate change, whether you're speaking about uh, AI, whether you're speaking about genomic sequencing, it's uh, truly crucial. So that's uh, the one I would stress the most. Thanks, Paolo. Uh, thanks, uh, Marco. Uh, Paolo and Florence, do you want to add something from the whole? Yeah, yeah. Uh, if I mean, for us, I, I, at least for me, 
the most important thing uh, to us to the lawyers is please help us in uh, solving the crazy situation of consent forms and uh, try to find one consent um, good for everybody, uh, for anybody, for any country, because it's really a mess. And together with this, protection of the data. The risk, we have a lot of American uh, scientists here and then lawyers, the risk is to protect as in Fort Knox. We are completely protected, safe, but not able to communicate with any, anybody outside of the fort. And this is something we should completely avoid. Thank you, and Florence? Well, I, I, say, I would say that the same uh, thing as John said at the beginning is that um, for the moment, uh, as very few exist for uh, environments, I would say we need more dialogue with lawyers so to um, uh, educate them to the language and the problems and vice versa. Um, so to really identify the emergencies, because uh, actually I would say there are really multiples. <laughs> so it's, it's hard to really define one, but I would say local help to local population is the most urgent right now, because people have to change their activity or switch their activity to adapt to climate change. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other questions somewhere? We have less than 10 minutes left. We have Paola, Paola Rodari from ASOF. Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for the Hi, session. Paola, how are you? Ciao. <laughs> well, it's super interesting uh, session, really. Thank you very much. I have just a question for Professor Gasperini. He says that there is no uh, common language between lawyers and scientists. And you mentioned about adjectives, for example, that are, that are interpreted in a very different way. I'm very interested in that because I think, yes, that's very important to have a common language. Yeah, we need, definitely, we need a common language. It's something we already experienced in the scientific field because we, we had to uh, share, for example, in projects uh, and define a common language with, with chemists, with physicists, and we need the same uh, with, with lawyers. For example, uh, in, in many cases, we use significant. For us, significant means something, uh, for the lawyers, it means completely, something completely different. Uh, so once you write guidelines or rules, you should um, be aware that same I mean, the same word could be interpreted in a different ways. And, and we need to pay a lot of efforts in trying to find a common language. Any other question? Nothing from the audience here, unless there's something on YouTube. Uh, so let let you me, can let draw me the just say one thing about, about the last question and the last answer by Paolo Gasparini. Sometimes, uh, and I'm speaking for Italy right now, sometimes I have seen in the last several years that there are not, not, not problems of common language between scientists and lawyers but between science and law at all. Uh, so it's, it's a problem that, that we have seen in, in many trials that involve scientists sometimes, and, and trials about vaccines and, and vaccinations. And, and I think that, that we really need uh, a, a common path uh, that, that takes us uh, uh, to more clear laws, more clear regulations, uh, and something that is, that is more easy for everybody uh, to live their own lives. I want to thank you, everybody, because it was very interesting. And, and well, thanks again to, well, not a problem for the Italians who are well awake at 5, 5.30 in the <laughs> afternoon. But thanks again for our Californian friends. And, and thank you for inviting me to moderate this session. It was, it was beautiful. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.